Hello knitwits and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. I am the titular Willie, Willie Muse, joined as always by my co-host Nitkalis. And if you're like me, you've grown increasingly concerned by the shocking lack of growth that my channel has experienced over the past few weeks. Don't get me wrong, the fact that anyone out there is watching this garbage at all still feels like a small miracle to me, and I cannot stress how much I appreciate all of you who are currently watching this. But that said, as I continue to release new videos to smaller and smaller view counts, I can't help but take stock and think back fondly to that week and a half in July when people seemed genuinely interested in the stuff that I put out to the point that I actually had hope for the future of my channel. Happier times. Still, I'm no quitter, and if life has taught me one thing repeatedly, it's that just because I've lost all hope, that doesn't mean that things are hopeless. I, I, I think that I can get my views back to where they were back at their peak eventually. I just, I just gotta play the game a little bit. Growing your audience on this health site is all about appeasing the algorithm. Like, like I'm some sort of high priest sacrificing a virgin on the altar as a gift to the sun god back in the times when they used to do that sort of thing. I don't have that thing that the kids call artistic integrity, so I will literally make a video about anything at this point if it means there's a chance it will get picked up by the algorithm and grow my viewership. Like, like I'm not even joking when I say that the only thing keeping me from literally sacrificing a virgin to the algorithm is the fact that I feel like that video would probably get flagged by YouTube and taken down for being too violent. Of course, then the question becomes, if murder's not the answer, then how do I go about appeasing the algorithm? And the short answer is by giving it things that it likes. The, the goal of the algorithm is to keep people on YouTube, so if you make content about things that have already proven themselves capable of keeping eyes on the screens, the algorithm is more likely to promote them to new viewers. There are already a lot of people on here looking for content about popular topics like like Pokemon, for example. So were I to make a video about Pokemon, there's a lot bigger audience of people for the algorithm to suggest my video to than there would be if I made another video about some of the more niche topics I've covered in the past, you know, like like Ernest Scared Stupid or, or my own self-doubt. Not, not a huge audience for my own self-doubt, unfortunately. And this is basically just a long way of saying that popular things are popular. So if I want my video to become popular, I should start making them about topics that are already popular on the internet. And so with that in mind, I would like to welcome you to the inaugural episode of my newest series, Hey, this thing is popular. Maybe if I make a video about it, the algorithm will pick me up and make me popular too. That title is subject to change. Before I could make a video about something popular though, I had to figure out what that popular thing was going to be. So I did my best to make a list of all the popular things I could think of in order to come up with a topic for my inaugural episode. And as, as I read over my list and sadly changed the font size in order to make it take up a single full page, two things became very clear to me. One, I don't, I don't really know what's popular anymore because I'm crusty and old now. And two, the topic for this first video is a no-brainer. If you're watching this, you probably already know what that topic I picked is because you've already seen the title and thumbnail for this video because that, that's, that's how YouTube works. But, but just in case you clicked onto the video without paying attention and can't be bothered to look down slightly, I will reiterate that the first topic I picked is Harry Potter. Not only is Harry Potter a hugely popular franchise that appeals to fans of all ages and backgrounds, but it's also a franchise that I personally have a fairly interesting relationship with, because 
truth is the weirdest, coolest, most interesting thing that ever happened to me happened because of Harry Potter. So rather than blabbering on, I'm going to get on with it and tell you all about that weird thing. So without any further ado, this is the story of how I got published in a Harry Potter book. The year is 2015. A young Chris Pratt rules the box office as the world doesn't yet realize that we all hate him. Bruno Mars releases Uptown Funk, forever revolutionizing the wedding DJ industry, and Democrats everywhere are bracing as Obama prepares to leave office, opening the door for the horrible possibility that Jeb Bush might soon take his place. While all that was going on, I was in New York working to create content for the internet, which well, I guess now that I'm saying it out loud, not a lot has changed in all that time, except I guess back then I had a steady paycheck and better insurance and people that I could talk to during the day. Oh God. Back then, I was working at a humor website, which for those of you too young to remember, a website is kind of like an app, only instead of living on your phone, it lives on the internet. And humor was this thing we used to do for fun back before the pandemic killed our ability to feel stuff. I won't say what site it was because, well, I don't want to piss off anyone on the off chance that I say something dumb in this video, but it's not hard to look up and honestly, it doesn't even really matter anyway because the site I worked for doesn't exist anymore and if we're being honest that makes a lot of sense to me because well I'm surprised that it lasted for as long as it did. If I were to describe my old job in nautical terms I would say that I was the lowest level sailor on the crew of a sinking ship and it was my job to take a bucket and shovel scoop after scoop of water off the deck in an effort to slow down the ship's inevitable demise. Also, the bucket I was given had a hole in it and, and, and also there were a bunch of higher ranking sailors whose only job was to occasionally come down to my part of the ship and tell me that my bucket was offensive to advertisers, so now I have to use my hands. Like literally everything else in the world, our business model relied entirely on revenue from advertisers. In the simplest of terms, we'd make articles and put ads on them, and the more people read our articles, the more the advertisers would pay us. Uh, th this meant that the name of the game was getting clicks, and. So that made things very difficult for us because by that time, people really did not like to click on things if they didn't have to. There's honestly a million different ways that Facebook changed the landscape of the internet, but there is one way in particular that really affected my old job, and that's that people stopped going to places online that, that, that weren't Facebook. Before social media became a thing, scrolling through the internet meant going from website to website to see all the stuff you wanted to see, but with the advent of Facebook, people got used to seeing everything they wanted to see all in one spot, and so getting them to click away from that spot became harder and harder to do, P particularly when, when the place that you were trying to get them to click away to was so bogged down by ads that it was almost impossible for it to load sometimes. If people were going to click off of Facebook, they needed to make their click count, so they weren't going to do it for just anything. Ba basically, you're not going to go to a whole other website just to see a single picture of a guy getting kicked in the balls because you could already see a single picture of a guy getting kicked in the balls on the website you're already on. So. If we wanted their click, we needed to give them something more, you know, like like 10 pictures of a guy getting kicked in the balls. I, I know this sounds like I'm joking, but I'm not. The, 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 this is what we did. 
For the longest time, our business model relied on creating lists of aggregated content from around the internet because that was what was most likely to lure people onto our website. Pe people loved them and they were quick to make and they helped sustain our antiquated business model in a way that worked out great for everyone. Except for me. You see, I was a writer, not an aggregator. There, there, there were people in my department whose entire job was to create aggregated articles, and they were way, way better at it than, than I could ever hope to be. So they were the ones who made the lists, obviously. Uh, as a writer, it was my job to create original content for the website, and that meant I had my own set of challenges to deal with, first and foremost being that nobody liked original articles. Nobody was like, hey, I'm in the mood to laugh right now. You know what I should do? Read. Right now, a lot of you are probably mad that you clicked on a video about Harry Potter only to be greeted with a long rant about online media in the pre-Trump era. But I promise you all that background information was necessary because without it, you won't be able to fully understand why exactly I did what what I did. That made it sound way more ominous than I meant it to. I didn't like murder anyone, just to be clear. I'm just trying to give you guys like context for my thought process. I said earlier that it's hard to get someone to click away from Facebook to see a single picture of a guy getting kicked in the balls when there are already pictures of people getting kicked in the balls on Facebook, but What's even harder is to try and get people to click away from Facebook to, to see a like pictureless 10 paragraph article about how your cat is like a bad roommate. It's, especially, you know, when there are already pictures of, of people getting kicked in the balls on Facebook. I, I don't care how much you say you value the written word comedically speaking it's very hard to write anything funnier than a picture of a guy getting kicked in the balls like i will be honest to this day i i have no idea why my job even existed at all like i didn't contribute much in the way of page views no nobody really liked the majority of my articles and as best i can tell the only purpose that my content ever served was to occasionally alienate potential advertisers. Like I genuinely think that the only reason I was employed for as long as I was is because my job became obsolete too quickly for them to question it. And even if they did question it, they paid me so little that nobody going over the budget realized I existed enough to fire me. That said, though, I wasn't going to question it either. It may have been obsolete and doomed to fail, but I had a job writing comedy, and I was going to do my damnedest to keep it, whatever it took. Basically, I needed to create original articles that would get a lot of clicks, but since the best way to get clicks was with articles that were decidedly not original, the best thing I could think to do was to often make articles that looked like I had aggregated them from across the internet even though I had actually pulled them entirely from betwixt my butt cheeks. Back in the day, I would write articles in the form of text messages or tweets or social media or anything else that looked like it could have been screenshotted off of an actual thing that I found on the internet because that's what people were interested in and that's what got clicks. And that may make it sound like I was purposefully trolling or knowingly creating fake news, but I promise you that was never my intention. My goal was to make things that seemed at first glance like they could be real in order to get people interested enough to click in, but once they did so, it was always my hope that they'd realize that what they were reading was comedic and hopefully have a good laugh because of it. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't always the case, but, but I'll get to that in a little bit. Repeatedly coming up with new ways to make content in the form of fake screenshots got difficult after a while though, so I would look to anything that I could for inspiration. And One of the easiest places to find inspiration for an article that would do well was by looking at other articles that had already done well. 
I would often read the aggregated articles that were popular on our site to see if I could do my own original version of them. I'd, I'd take the basic format of the article, do my best to put my own comedic spin on it, and essentially write what amounted to a parody of my own website's content. And right here is where all you Harry Potter heads can unclench your buttholes because this is where the Harry Potter of it all comes in. One day, one of my co-workers released an aggregated article that was all about J.K. Rowling's Twitter and all the time she expanded on Harry Potter lore through responding to social media. It did really well, and so in my quest to chase success and keep my job for another week, I thought, hey, that would be a fun thing to replicate. And so I did. J.K. Rowling was known for answering fans' questions about her books on Twitter with information that what wasn't really present in the books themselves, so I thought it would be fun to come up with more specific questions and have her give way more absurd answers. And from that kernel of an idea grew the following article. So without any further ado, here is my 2015 article, J.K. Rowling knows way too much about her characters. Like I said, uh, our website doesn't exist anymore, so everything I ever wrote has been wiped from the internet. Uh, so I'm gonna have to read from my Google Doc that I wrote way back then. Um, but let me just find that now. So the first part of the article was actually a couple of real things that JK Rowling actually wrote because I wanted to establish up top the real behavior I was parodying in order to ground things in reality before they went off the rails. So I started the article with screenshots of real tweets from her actual Twitter like this. At JK Rowling, my wife said there are no Jews at Hogwarts. I'm a Jew, so I assume she said it to be the only magical one in the family. Thoughts? At Benjamin Rothman. Anthony Goldstein, Ravenclaw, Jewish wizard. My, my JK Rowling's not great, but hopefully, hopefully it'll get better with practice. From there, I wanted to create a bridge between the baseline reality and some of the more outlandish stuff I was going to say later on in the article. So for my first uh, made up tweet, I tried to think of something that felt believable, but silly. And what I came up with was, at JK Rowling, have any of the Hogwarts teachers ever dated? At Cedric Fan, of course! Sprout and Flitwick had a long-term relationship. They broke up, but remained friends. It seemed like a dumb enough question and answer that I felt like it took the article slightly closer into the realm of the ridiculous, but it wasn't so far out of the realm of possibility that it didn't still feel like something Rowling would actually say. Also, I genuinely don't really know that much about Harry Potter, and those were the only two minor characters I could remember, so my options were kind of limited. After that, I wanted to start turning things up to 11, so I needed a tweet that would cause things to flip a little bit, and I figured the way to do that would be to have something that started out normal enough, but then got a little bit cuckoo. Since one of the best known instances of J.K. Rowling's retconning habit was telling people that Dumbledore was gay, despite the fact that the books kind of portray him as more of like a sexless Tom Bombadil, I figured I should include that in my article somehow. And then since I know how the internet works, I realized that once Rowling established one of her characters as being capable of sex, fans of hers probably wanted to know more about the kind of sex that they have. So the next question I included was this. At JK Rowling, if Dumbledore really is gay, is he a top or a bottom? Question mark. Ha ha. I guess I didn't have to say question mark. I'm bad at reading. There's no chance in hell she doesn't get asked that all the time because... Well, let's be honest, I'm a little bit curious myself. So I figured that it counted as a believable question that could have actually existed in the real world. That said, it stands to reason that in the real world, Rowling just ignores that question when she gets it. So to fully and finally establish my article as satire, I had her do the opposite of that and actually answer the question. 
at Buddha Dinosaur. Dumbledore likes all manner of sex, but generally speaking, he tends to be a top. Thanks for asking. I don't, I don't know why I said he was a top, though, because obviously he's a power bottom. With that response, my hope was to establish the fact that in the world of my dumb article, there was no question about Harry Potter that Rowling could not or would not answer. And once I had established that fact, I did my best to see how far I could run with it. And so here's, here's the rest of the article. I'm sorry in advance. At JK Rowling, does Hogwarts have sex ed classes? At Moaning Turtle, unfortunately no, wizards tend to be a little more conservative with such things. Of course, like all teens, they eventually figure things out and experiment with their sexuality. For example, group masturbation sessions are exceedingly common in the Hogwarts dormitories, particularly Hufflepuff. At JK Rowling, since wizards wear different clothes, does that mean they have different kinds of underwear too? At Dumblebee, no, wizards choose from the same options as muggles do. Harry is primarily a boxer's man, while Ron prefers briefs, nothing exciting. The only noteworthy person I can mention here is Lupin, who has exceedingly large genitalia. As such, he would often switch between wearing no underwear at all and wearing compression shorts that kept his balls from whipping around too much. At JK Rowling, why do wizards need toilets? Can't they just use magic? At Hufflepuff Girls, no, wizard bowel movements are enchanted, and as such, they cannot be dealt with by a simple charm. Wizard pipes are actually made from an enchanted metal called Gangalore, which aids in fighting clogs. Of course, accidents still happen. In year three, for example, Cho Chang took a huge dump after the Halloween banquet and broke the toilet for a week. Keep in mind that wizards wipe themselves with magic so the clog was all excrement and no toilet paper. That's how huge Cho's dump was. She may seem dainty, but Cho Chang takes monster shits. Hope that helps. Yeah, doing stuff like that was how I used to get health insurance. And I'm sorry to have gone so in depth into that because well for one thing i forgot how graphic that article got and for another that's two videos in a row now where i spent way too long explaining jokes and you're really not supposed to do that but i wanted to make sure you guys knew every step of my thought process so you know that what happened next was something that never once crossed my mind I published my article and then, well, I instantly forgot about it because my job was all about pumping out as much content as possible, so we really didn't have that much time to dwell on anything that we made. Truth told, I probably would have forgotten I had written my article altogether by now had the internet not come along and, you know, done its thing. Remember a few seconds ago when I talked about how our website survived by taking single items from social media and aggregating them into larger articles? Well, yeah, that kind of also worked in reverse. Social media is basically all about giving people a quick dopamine hit. So while no one was ever going to take one of my full articles and put it directly onto Facebook, what did happen a lot was that people would pick and choose the best parts of my articles and reduce my article to a single image that they would then put directly onto social media. Websites would then take those single images and include them in articles that they were aggregating. And then people would see those articles and take the single images and put them directly onto Facebook again. And things would continue like that while all the while the resolution got worse and worse until my original content was reduced to like four pixels on a meme page called like, like parents don't understand or something. And it somehow has 8 million likes. And, and yeah, that's pretty much what happened to my Harry Potter article. Every now and then over the next few years, I'd get tagged in a post that was just like a screenshot of one of the more absurd sections of my article that someone had ripped off of our website. And like 
officially as a content creator, I feel like I'm supposed to be angry that my shit kept getting stolen, but unofficially, it was honestly kind of cool because people tended to like the stolen version of my articles a lot more than the originals. And after a certain amount of pumping out an endless stream of content, it was kind of just nice to know that people liked the things that I made on some level. Also, if we're being honest, I'm probably better off not being credited with the phrase Cho Chang takes monster shits. Like, like I feel like that belongs to the universe now. I, I, I don't need it to be associated with me. Still, for as nice as it was to see people liking and sharing something I had written, what was not as nice was the fact that every time I saw a stolen version of one of my fake JK Rowling tweets, I would also, without fail, see at least 20 people in the comments questioning if Rowling had actually said the thing that they were reading, which, well, well, well it was concerning m more than anything. In those people's defense, I guess, they did look pretty real because the designer I worked with to make them was one of the most talented people alive, and so he made the tweets look like legit screenshots, and they were very convincing. Also, side note, while we're on the topic of the designer, I do want to give credit where credit is due and point out that he's responsible for my personal favorite part of the tweets because he came up with all the usernames of the people asking the questions and I, I don't know, there's just something about moaning turtle that makes me giggle every time I read it to this day. Still, no matter how convincing the tweets looked, I had kind of assumed that once people saw famed children's author J.K. Rowling giving graphic descriptions of one of her character's massive testicles, they would assume that what they were reading was a joke, and that was unfortunately not the case. Like, like I don't think that a lot of people believed that the tweets were real in the grand scheme of things, but there were enough who did that it was more than a little bit upsetting to watch sometimes. Don't get me wrong, it was also very funny to watch, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't mildly proud that people believed my tweets because making the tweets believable was kind of the goal of my original article, but with all that being said, every new comment I saw asking, is this real, was more than anything just another blow to the faith I had left in humanity, and Let's be honest, that was, that was already tenuous at best. For the life of me, I could not fathom how people could possibly think that my fake tweets were real because one, they are so clearly not, and two, even if they were believable, they are also quite easily fact-checked. So if people really wanted to know if they were real, they could have used the same amount of effort it took to comment is this real, and instead done just like, like the most basic of detective work. Which I guess, to be fair, at least one person did. A little while after my article was published, I was made aware of at least one person who did their best to fact check the tweet about, you know, all the the circle jerks going off in Hufflepuff, and they did this by going straight to the source and asking Rowling herself. And the reason that I know that this happened is because J.K. Rowling fucking responded. At J.K. Rowling, is this real? I need to know if you said this. BTW, you're my hero. No, that's fake. Yeah, that, that, that wasn't really my proudest moment. Actually, you know what? It may have been my proudest moment, but it was my proudest moment in a way that made me realize that I should really be deeply ashamed of all of my life decisions. Like I said, I had never set out to be a troll, so finding out that JK Rowling had seen at least one of my fake tweets made me feel kind of bad. Like, like, the woman clearly has a lot of affection for the character she created, so I genuinely wish she never had to experience the ways in which I perverted them. That said, I'd be lying if I said it didn't also feel really, really, 
really, really cool. She is arguably the most influential writer of our lifetime. So as a writer myself, knowing that she read something I wrote felt like a feat, even if the thing that she read was about a bunch of magical teenagers playing Soggy Biscuit in their dormitory. It may sound small or stupid, but for a period, knowing that she saw the thing that I made felt like it might be the biggest accomplishment of my life. Like, granted, it was an accidental accomplishment, but so was penicillin, so who am I to question it? I kind of thought like, hey, this is going to be the cool thing that happens in my life. You know, I, I had my moment and it was fun and now I have a good story that I can tell at parties. Or, or like it would be a story I told at parties if if I ever went to a party and, and, and didn't just talk to the same three people I always talk to who who already know every single one of my stories. In any case, I was pretty positive at the time that J.K. Rowling responding to that tweet had to be the end of the story, and if it had been, it would still be the most interesting thing to happen to me in my otherwise dull life. But as it turned out, the story was just getting warmed up, because somehow, things just kept getting weirder. In November of 2017, a Twitter user named Ibid11962 tweeted at me saying, It looks like one of your jokes has entered official Harry Potter canon. Congratulations. And upon reading this tweet, my first thought was, What? Apparently, they released annotated versions of the Sorcerer's Stone for each one of the Hogwarts houses, and they included a lot of new trivia about the Harry Potter canon, and one of the pieces of trivia that they included in the Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff versions of the book was taken directly from the fake tweet that I had made up uh, about Sprout and Flitwick going to town on each other. As best as I can tell, someone was tasked with collecting all the lore that Rowling had blasted out onto the internet, and my silly but not too silly fake tweet was convincing enough that it made its way into the mix and accidentally got included as a part of official Harry Potter canon. And yeah, here it is. Uh, I, I bought the Hufflepuff version because I'm a Hufflepuff. And right here on page 342 is a version of my tweet that's worded close enough to the original version that I feel pretty confident that it's not a coincidence. Did you know, Professor Sprout had a long-term relationship with fellow teacher Professor Flitwick. Sadly, it didn't work out, but they remain good friends. I'll be honest, I'm a little bit upset that the one they included wasn't the one about Lupin's balls, but... That said, this is probably the closest I'm ever going to get to being published in a book, so I'm not about to complain. Back in the sweater you go. I responded to Ibid in the most eloquent way I could think of, and then I shared what I had just learned with my coworkers on Slack, thinking we'd all have a nice laugh about it. When he read what I shared, my boss, who is much, much, much better at the internet than I am, realized that I had an interesting story and asked if I would like to write an article about the experience. And since I didn't want to try and think of another idea for an article to write that day, I was happy to do it. My boss then threw the article I wrote on Reddit where a bunch of people saw it who wouldn't have otherwise because... Well, Reddit is awful, but it's also one of the best ways to grow things on the internet. P please, please put my videos on Reddit. M Mama needs more subs. The article did pretty decently there, and it caught the eyes of a few publications who did little write-ups on the story, and I was even put in contact with our website's publicist, which was a first. Not, not, not a lot came from it because people had lost interest in the story by the time the publicist returned my call, but it felt nice all the same. And like, I'll be honest, at this point, my job wasn't really agreeing with me. It had become harder and harder to ignore the fact that nobody gave a crap about the things I was making, and as the ever-changing landscape of the internet made my position more and more obsolete with each passing day, things in the office just kept feeling grimmer and grimmer. 
Having my article gain traction and get written up made me feel genuinely good in a way that I hadn't felt for a very long time. It was really nice to have people acknowledge the things that I made, even if it was for stupid reasons. And for the first time in a while, it felt like, like, okay, maybe the things that I make do matter, even if it's only in a small, stupid, extremely inconsequential way. I had made my mark and had my moment, and even if it wasn't the mark and the moment I had hoped for in my life, it felt nice all the same, and I was happy to take any win the universe was willing to give me. And as much as I would love for that to be the end of my story because, well, I'm lazy and that would mean less editing for me, unfortunately, there's a little bit more to the situation nowadays. Like, like in a perfect world, this would just be a fun, nice, weird little story that I'd have about my life, but certain things happened recently that made it so I cannot tell the story without including one huge asterisk at the end. And that asterisk is, of course, fuck JK Rowling. For those of you who somehow don't know, JK Rowling recently revealed that she has some extremely terrible views on trans people in a way that is extremely disappointing for a lot of the people who grew up loving her and the things that she created. And while I certainly wasn't the biggest victim of her decision to start sucking, it certainly did put a damper on what had once felt like my biggest accomplishment. These days, Rawlings' Twitter is associated less with overzealous retconning and more with bigotry, so telling the story about the joke I made about it is a lot less fun now than it used to be. I remember where I was when I found out that Rowling had decided to make transphobia her entire personality now, and I just remember thinking, like, well, yeah, of course. She's a billionaire who probably hasn't had anyone tell her no since George Bush was in office. I was honestly surprised at how many people were surprised because I guess I had just naturally assumed that her opinions on the trans community were not going to be all that great. And if she had kept those terrible opinions to herself, that would have been one thing. But like a lot of billionaires, she instead believed that her terrible opinions were so important that the whole world needed to hear them. And as she dug her feet in more and more, my opinion on the situation changed from like, well, obviously this is the case, to are you serious right now, Joanne? It's kind of hard to remember just how beloved J.K. Rowling used to be, but she was pretty much a modern day mother goose. She had created a thing that people genuinely loved, and she seemed like a lovely person, and if you had told me six years ago that I would be railing against her in a YouTube video, I would have said you were insane, and also, why am I making YouTube videos in six years? That does not give me hope for the future. She was an icon, so the moment she willingly decided to torpedo her own public image, I couldn't help but feel like... Like, why can't we just have nice things, you know? And it's especially frustrating because do you know how easy it would have been for J.K. Rowling to stay beloved? Like, she wouldn't have even needed to stop being a bigot. She would just need to have recognized that her views are backwards and keep them to herself. And then we wouldn't be in this situation right now. And like, like honestly... That should have been easy, because why is she wasting her time stirring up controversy on Twitter anyway? She literally has enough money to genetically engineer a unicorn and then spend all day in her backyard playing polo on said unicorn. So the idea that she would willingly choose to spend any amount of time on Twitter is frankly offensive to anybody who still pays rent. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Billionaires are terrible at being rich. Like, like, just look at how badly they fuck up the Met Gala every year. My anger at her inability to enjoy her money didn't last long, though, as it was quickly replaced by just general anger at her and what kind of person she turned out to be. And, like, I feel like right now some of you might be saying that I'm being harsh because, like, She's done a lot of good things, and one bad opinion doesn't make you a bad person. But just for the record, it's not her bad opinions that make me 
think that she's not that great. I know there are a lot of people who aren't fully educated on trans issues and haven't had enough experience with trans people to know how harmful their beliefs can be. And I don't think that those people are unsalvageable assholes. Most of them just need a little bit more time. I myself would be lying if I said I came out of the womb fully enlightened on all issues related to gender and have never done or said anything transphobic over the course of my entire life without realizing how shitty it could be. Like, like who knows? I might accidentally say something transphobic in this very video because I'm kind of in over my head with this subject matter and I often put my foot in my mouth. That said though, I can promise you one thing, and that's that if I do say something dumb, I will listen and learn and do my best going forward because I truly think that's the best any of us can do. But th that's super not what Rowling did. Rowling seems to be hyper-educated on trans issues and has had every opportunity to change her mind. Like, I have no doubt that she is well aware of things like gender dysphoria, increased homelessness, and violence against transgender individuals. And the fact that she looks at those things and is still like, no, you know what? I'm still going to be an asshole about this, is what makes me look at her and think that there is something that fundamentally sucks about her as a person. The fact that it is the year... Well, somewhere between 2016 and 2030, I've lost count. But the fact that it's a year beginning with a 20 and there are still people out there who think that being a bigot is worth their time is insane to me. Like, like I know that she has some knowledge of history because she pretends to speak Latin. So I feel like she should know that there have been a lot of times that people have dragged their feet on accepting other groups of people. And that does not usually age well. Like, honestly, if it wasn't so soul-crushingly horrible, transphobia is ridiculous enough that it would be kind of funny. Like, I remember when everyone was talking about those bathroom bills and the other side's thought processes were so antithetical to my own that listening to them talk was, like, like strange more than anything. Every time I heard them speak, all I could think was just, like, 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 what? My favorite argument they would make was that if trans people were allowed to use public bathrooms, that would open the door to men worming their way into women's bathrooms and committing sexual assaults, which is just such a stupid idea to me. Like, I think it's very funny that they believe that there are people out there who are like, but, well, I really wanted to commit a sex crime right now, but... I don't know, the door says only women can go into that room. G guess I better not, I don't want to break the rules. Also, even if a stick figure with a dress on the door were the deterrent that transphobes seem to think that it is, their logic still wouldn't make much sense because trans men look like men and trans women look like women. Whether those people would want to admit it or not, they would not recognize most trans people as trans, particularly as I assume that none of them actually have any trans people in their lives. In the world where people are forced to use the bathroom that best matches the genitals they were born with, there would be a lot of men who look like men using the women's room. And honestly, if you're worried about some insane scenario where bathroom doors are the only thing keeping assaults at bay, that seems way worse to me because People could just lie and say that they are a trans man and get into the woman's room that way. And hearing myself say that out loud, I realize that it kind of sounds like I'm giving potential assaulters ideas, and I just want to make it clear that that was not my intention. I, I, I was just trying to point out that the argument makes no sense because they're not even solving the fake problem that they claim to be solving. Truly, if you look at it long enough, you start to realize that the logical endgame of what they were fighting for is an attendant outside of every public bathroom with just like, like a tiny flashlight whose only job is to inspect everyone's genitals before they took a pee, which is silly for a number of reasons. The most obvious being that you know who would absolutely hate that? Well, most people, but the ones who would hate it most of all are also the ones who are so uptight about using the bathroom that they won't do it next to a trans person. 
Almost as bad as the people who are trying to actively inflict transphobia on the world are the people who are doing it passively. Like, there are a lot of people who don't actually seem to care about trans people one way or the other more than anything. They just like to argue a bunch. Like, like they ask a bunch of gotcha questions which they pose. Like they're trying to gain an informed opinion, but really it kind of just seems like they're doing what they can to poke holes in whatever argument they're given because they're bored. And like, I get it. I think it's okay to ask questions, but there are a lot of people who do it just for the sake of asking questions in a way that I find really obnoxious. Like, I think that they would say that they're just trying to be fair and balanced, but what it actually comes off like is that they're playing devil's advocate with a person's life, which is not really a nice thing to do. Also, after a certain point, these people come off as extremely conceited based on the sheer amount of convincing they think they're entitled to. Like, one or two questions is fine, but eventually it starts to seem like they view themselves as, like, some sort of king hovering over trans people with, like, their ring outstretched just waiting for it to be kissed. Like, I feel like they're this close to flat out saying, like, prove yourself to me, squire, and perhaps I shall one day allow you to be a trans. Which is not to say that all their questions are stupid, like, a lot of them are, but I'd be lying if I said I never heard one that made me stop and go, huh. Like, the one that tripped me up for a long time was the old chestnut of, if gender is a social construct, then how can you be born the wrong one? And I definitely scratched my head at that one for a while. Like, like the part that confused me was why so many people would need to take hormones to feel better if the argument is that it's all arbitrary. Don't get me wrong, that never made me be like, well, I guess trans people can't be themselves then because there are a lot of things that I don't understand because I, like many people, am very stupid. I guess I just assumed trans people thought about it more than me and that's okay because if the benchmark for accepting shit was that everyone had to understand it perfectly, then there would be a lot of things that were not accepted for no reason. Which honestly kind of explains how things are going these days. That said though, the longer I thought about that question, the more I realized that it makes perfect sense. Like, I take medication for ADHD primarily so I can do work and function better in society. That's a social construct. I also take pills for social anxiety, which is also a social construct. It has social right there in the name. People do what they can to correct their body chemistry so they feel more comfortable in society all the time. I think trans people are the only ones who get shit for it because, I don't know, I guess there's a physical component to it, so people are nosier about it. Which, speaking of, I do want to acknowledge that there doesn't have to be a physical component to being trans. Like, the nature of this video requires me to focus a lot on the genitals part of sex and gender, but you don't need gender confirmation surgery or hormone replacement to be trans. Being trans can be as simple as the clothes you wear or the pronouns you use or any number of other things people can do that might make it feel a little bit better to be themselves. And honestly, this is where a lot of those questions start to feel a little bit shitty to me because I feel like it's not always easy to give the answers. Like, I feel like the answers for a lot of trans people is just like, I don't know, it makes me feel better. And if they can't put that feeling perfectly into words, it's treated like they've been stumped, which is very unfair. Like, I don't even think of myself as caring about my own gender all that much, but having been called ma'am every time I've ever ordered a pizza on the phone, I can tell you that it does irk me on some level. Why? I do not know, and I'm very happy that I've never had to sum up that feeling perfectly in order to prove my identity to someone because that sounds very hard and exhausting. I also think it's really funny that a lot of the arguments I see being made against trans people are being made by Christians on religious ground because that seems so counterintuitive to me. Like, 
even putting aside the whole love thy neighbor thing that is a cornerstone of their entire religion, I would still think that Christians would want to embrace trans people with every ounce of strength they have because I have been in many, many Christian spaces over the course of my life and one thing they talk a lot about is your soul. And if your goal is to prove the existence of a soul, you should start by talking to a trans person. Here you have a lot of people saying that their essence of who they are is not the same as their physical self and rather than being like, hey, that's what we believe too, let's listen. A lot of Christians are like, nope, doesn't make sense to me. Oh, but God doesn't like to make mistakes, right? Okay, but he does seem to like fucking with people an awful lot. Like, go read the book of Job and tell me that God is above making somebody feel dysphoric. I'm just spitballing here, but maybe, just maybe, trans people aren't a mistake. Maybe they're part of his divine plan that you repeatedly call a mystery, but also act like you know every last detail of. Yeah, but God made us in his image, so he would never want you altering your body in any way. Really? Because I've read snippets of the Bible, and I'm pretty sure that one of the first things he asked his followers to do was to cut off their own foreskin for him. Like, like maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to show that he is at the very least amenable to the idea that some of our genitals are a bit of a work in progress. And like obviously I don't think that JK Rowling is making any of those arguments because I assume she is an atheist because she gives off vibes like she's friends with Ricky Gervais now. And so to make sure I'm not strawmanning her, I wanted to go straight to the source and see what horrible argument is fueling her own particular brand of bigotry. And the best encapsulation of it I could find seems to be this quote. If sex isn't real, there's no same-sex attraction. If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women globally is erased. I know and love trans people, but erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many to meaningly discuss their lives. It isn't hate to speak the truth. I feel like my JK Rowling's getting a lot better. There are a lot of things I find silly about that quote, but my favorite is that the first thing she mentions is that without sex, there's no same-sex attraction, and she clearly only brings that up because she knows she's about to lose all of her liberal cred, and she's trying her best to be like, no, don't worry guys, I'm still cool. As far as what that quote tells us about her personal beliefs, I think that they boil down to two arguments that I've heard from a lot of people who aren't her, the first of which is that she believes that recognizing trans women as women cheapens what it means to be a woman, which like, if that's the case, then fuck you. Basically, JK seems to value the female experience so highly that it has become to her like a sort of exclusive club, and if you were to let just anyone into that club, it wouldn't be special anymore, which, not gonna lie, Sounds awfully Slytherin to me. Like, I don't think she can get past her perception of trans women as being men who are just switching teams because they like the clothes better, and so their womanhood doesn't actually count. Like, like I think in her head, a trans woman is kind of like that episode of Seinfeld where Jerry gets mad because he thinks his dentist converted to Judaism for the sole purpose of being able to tell Jewish jokes if that makes sense. It, it made sense in my head, but I'm not sure if it does once I said it out loud. I think she thinks that trans women are like getting all the perks of being a woman without having to do any of the grunt work to earn it, which is weird for a lot of reasons. First and foremost, because it kind of implies that her problem with trans people is that they don't struggle enough, which like, no, no. Not the hill you want to die on, Joanne. That said, though, I will admit that I'm hesitant to argue against this idea too much because despite what every pizza place in the tri-state area seems to think, I actually do identify as a male, so I don't want to pretend like I know enough about the female experience to argue about it with 
you know, like actual, actual women. Still, from where I'm standing, there are two points that I feel okay making. The first being that I got to imagine that everyone's experience as a female is different. Like, I guess I don't know this for sure, but what I do know is that my experience as a man is very different from a lot of other men's in a lot of different ways. Like off the top of my head, I got to imagine that a lot of other guys have never had to lie and say that their name was Erica so as not to embarrass the guy they were ordering a pizza from who just called them ma'am. Rowling talks about the lived reality of women globally in a way that kind of implies on some level that she thinks she knows what every woman's is experience as a woman is like. And I guess I don't know this for sure, but I feel like maybe... That's not the case. Like, I don't want to minimize her accomplishments and what she's gone through. But that said, I actually do know a couple of women who aren't white billionaires. And I feel very confident in saying that their experience is a little bit different from Rowling's. The other thing that I feel okay saying here is that if you really do want to celebrate the reality of women globally, then excluding trans women from that narrative is insane to me. That would be like if you were playing a game of pickup basketball and as you were picking teams, Michael Jordan came up and was like, hey, pick me. And you were like, nah, thanks. We're good with four people. There are many, many trans women who seem to me to exemplify what it means to be a woman. So to deny them their womanhood based solely on the gender they were assigned at birth seems to erase the lived reality of women globally way more than accepting trans people ever could. Like, like it basically implies that what it means to be female begins and ends with what's in your pants. And while, again, I don't know this for sure because I am a boy, from where I'm sitting, it really feels like there's a lot more to it than that. Kamala Harris, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Rosa Parks, Eleanor Roosevelt, Malala Yousafzai, Greta Thunberg, Anne Frank, Harriet Tubman, Amelia Earhart, all great women whose genitals I do not know the first thing about. I, I truly could not tell you what is going on down there and I feel pretty confident in saying that it doesn't matter because I don't think that it would really change who they are and what they've done. Beyond wanting to defend the lived reality of women globally, the crux of Rowling's belief seems to boil down to the very simple idea that Men are men, and women are women, and that's just the way it is. Which, like, if that is your argument, it's weird that you, you are, in fact, a woman who rose to prominence by changing your name so that people thought you were a man. But let's talk about this idea, because honestly, I feel like it's the core of every single argument that I've discussed in this video. Regardless of the transphobe, I think that the fundamental belief that drives them all is the idea that the way we have been taught to view gender is an objective truth of the world. People who identify with a gender that's different from the one they were assigned at birth are basically living in a fantasy land, and so the transphobe aren't going to indulge in their delusions because men are men and women are women, and that's the way it's always been. And like a lot of ignorant things, this is a very simple argument. And so in order to argue against it, I will fight fire with fire with my own very simple argument. And that's that a lot of people disagree. I honestly don't know what's true sometimes. Like if there is some divine referee out there who's going to come down and rule one way or another if gender is real, I can't say 100% which side they're going to land on. But what I can say though is that for as many people out there saying that gender is an objective truth, there are enough other people saying that that truth doesn't apply to them, that it feels silly for me not to listen to them and question things a little bit. And when you do question things long enough, it becomes really hard to pinpoint the objective truth that those people seem to be pointing to. Like, one thing I will grant them is that it is objectively true that some people are born with penises and some are born with vaginas, and said genitals tend to grant certain shared characteristics to their respective owners. But that said, that's not the case for everyone. It is also objectively true that intersex people exist. So where do they fall in the objective truth? Do they just not count because 
To me, that feels like a bit of a cop-out. If your argument is that gender is this neat little binary with two options based on the kind of hoo-ha you were born with, then you can't just ignore the many, many people who, by your own metrics, do not fall neatly into that binary, because... Well, that's not how arguments work. If it was, being a lawyer would be a lot easier. You could just go into court and be like, Your Honor, my client is not guilty. Except of the crimes he committed, but let's just be cool and ignore those. And maybe I'm wrong, and that's not the argument that these people are making, but if it isn't, and there's more to their views on gender than just what's in everybody's pants, then I would very much like to know what those views are, because for the life of me, I cannot tell. Once you get past the wieners and vajayjays of it all, everything else I can think of that would traditionally connote someone's gender from their clothes and their hair length to their roles in society and what bathroom they use are all extremely subjective and constantly changing. Like to me it kind of feels like what people like Rowling are saying is this is just the way things are because this is the way that it's always been, but no it hasn't. This sort of shit has been evolving and changing since the day the loincloth was invented because all of it was on some level created by us. Hell, even the words we use to describe everything we're talking about were made up by us. Like, right now I'm essentially talking about what it means to be male and female, but those words were created by humans at some point, which means that, like, there had to be a point where some version of them didn't exist. I got to imagine that there was at least a moment there where dividing society along gender lines was not something that had occurred to us. Like, I guess I don't know this for sure, but if I had to bet, I would say that the words for male and female came at least a little bit after the words for holy shit, there's a tiger behind that rock. If I had to guess, I would say that gender as we know it started when two cavemen had a moment in between tiger attacks to look down and say like, hey, you have an Audi and I have an Innie. Neat. W what should we call this new discovery of ours? And they came up with a couple of grunts that meant man and woman and things kind of just took off from there. They then went to their friend and were like, hey, Og, you'll never guess what we just noticed. And Og was like, wait, are you guys talking about dicks right now? Because like, yeah, I noticed those things too. Weird how not everyone has one, right? And then the cavemen told Og the grunts they came up with to connote male and female, and Og was like, yeah, those work for me. If we ever need to talk about this stuff, I'll use those grunts too. Then they let more people in on their new words, and as they did, people added their own observations to the definition of the word. Og was like, hey, Ook, just so you know, we're gonna call the ones without balls pogs now. And Ook was like, wait, are you talking about the ones who can give birth to babies? And Og was like, oh yeah, a lot of them can give birth to babies, huh? I guess giving birth to babies must be part of what it means to be a pog. And then somewhere down the line, someone stopped and was like, hey, you know how pogs give birth, right? And Ook, who had now become king, was like, do I? I invented that. And then the other guy was like, well, I was thinking, since we want to keep our species going, maybe we should let the pogs stay back while we hunt. That way we won't risk losing anyone who might be able to give us children if a tiger attacks. And Ook was like, that's good thinking, Bach. You shall be king someday. I, I don't know why these people have established a monarchy before gender, but it's my fake hypothetical story, so let me have it. Then, ten years later, when Ugin Bach had died of old age, a new generation came around, and one of them turned to their friend and was like, Hey, have you ever noticed how pogs are always the ones doing the gathering? And the friend was like, yes, finally somebody said it. And more and more people made that observation and gathering was absorbed into the meaning of what it meant to be a pog. Which again is my made up word for woman in this story. I don't know why I don't just say woman. And things just continued like that. The way we perceived the world continued to change our society, and the way our society changed 
continued to change how we perceive the world, and all that stuff just evolved and morphed until eventually we got to where we are now with these two words, male and female, that were forged by eons of humans just trying to make sense out of the world around them, and they contain so many different perspectives crammed into such a small amount of letters that it can honestly be hard to sort out exactly what they're supposed to mean sometimes. So much of human society is dictated by the perceptions that were passed down by those who came before us. And when you stop to think about that, you start to realize that a lot of the things at the cornerstones of our civilization, you know, gender, language, economy, culture, they're not the stable facts of life that some of us wish that they were. They're just a bunch of ever-evolving things that we made up to better make sense out of the world around us. And as much as we want to view them as objective truths, more than anything, they're just lore. Which is not to take anything away from their importance because those things are beautiful parts of the human experience. Well, well economy not so much, but culture and language are absolutely poggers. Still, just because they're important does not mean that they are set in stone. In fact, I would say that the opposite is true. I think that they are constantly changing and I think that's a good thing. Unfortunately though, not everyone agrees with me on that one. The lore we inherit is the foundation of a lot of people's worlds, so if you find out that the foundation isn't as stable as you hoped, it can make you feel like your entire world is about to come crashing down, which is not something that anyone wants. Like, like we all know you're not supposed to build your house on sand, but if you do build it on sand by accident, it's probably a lot easier to ignore the creaks you hear and pray that it doesn't collapse than willingly tear it down and build it again somewhere else. It also doesn't help that a lot of the objective truths of our lives are born from the lore. Our ability to perceive the world is extremely powerful, so those perceptions we create have the ability to affect the world in genuine, tangible ways. I don't want to put words in her mouth because... Well, I already did that once, but if I were to read between the lines of why Rowling is so passionate about her own dumb ideals, it's because she, as a female, does objectively have a different set of challenges from those of a male. Society's perceptions of women have made it so that Rowling has had to face real, measurable challenges in her life because of her gender. That is a fact. And because so many objective truths of her life are rooted in the ways in which society perceives women, I can see how it would be easy to lose track of the fact that the ways in which society perceives women are not necessarily rooted in objective truths. And this is the case for a lot of things. There are so many genuine systemic truths created by the lore passed down to us that it can be easy to get lost in that lore. We're only able to perceive what we're able to perceive, and even though what we're able to perceive feels like the entire world to us, it's honestly just a blip in the grand scheme of things. In that quote I talked about before, J.K. Rowling said she was speaking the truth, but whether she wants to admit it or not, what she should have said was she is speaking her truth. She has a certain view of gender that was created by her experiences and her place in the world and the chemicals that make up her body, and it's important to her, so you know what? Good for her. There's one thing I hope you take away from this video, it's that everybody should be allowed to live their truth. What I don't think people should be doing though is confusing their truth with the truth and trying to impose it on other people who maybe don't see it that way. Because look, I don't think that any of the stuff I said in this video is bound to convince anyone who wasn't already on board, okay? I'm not that dense. Like, in an alternate reality where Rowling is watching this, I don't think that she'd get to the end of my arguments about gender and be like, well, I never thought of it that way. You've swayed me. Ten points for Gryffindor. That said, she doesn't really need to agree. She just needs to accept that we're entitled to our own worldview just as much as she's entitled to hers. And as long as she does that, everything will be fine. Because we all have our own truth. One of the great paradoxes of life as a human is the fact that we all exist in this one big world together, but at the same time, we also kind of all exist in our own little world too. Our experiences and our points of view and the different chemicals that make up our body are all different from person to person. and They come together to make it so that even though you and I might be standing right next to one another, the worlds we're perceiving are often light years apart. 
If a lot of our society is just lore, then I think it's safe to say that we all also have our own headcanons as well, and I honestly think that's great. Unfortunately, though, not everyone agrees with that statement all the time. There are a bunch of things that make me giggle when I think about all the stuff that happened because of my dumb article, but in hindsight, I think the funniest thing is that I'm pretty sure they corrected subsequent reprintings and took out the part about Flitwick and Sprout, which, if that's the case, like, wh why bother? Sometimes I think about the possibility that someone got in trouble at their job because of my article and it makes me feel really bad, but then I think about what they would be getting in trouble for and it makes me giggle again. I kind of just keep picturing an English version of J. Jonah Jameson screaming from across his desk like, You said two wizards who never existed used to fuck even though that goes against canon that we ourselves created. Are you trying to make us look like a fool? You're on thin ice, McCoy. I I'm assuming that their last name was McCoy there. I don't know that to actually be the case. And like, look, I don't actually think that JK Rowling was ever or will ever actually be aware of my little typo. I doubt she even knows that that version of the book ever existed, but that said, I do think that if they did correct the typo, it was definitely because of Rowling herself. It seems very obvious that Rowling has her own headcanon for her books, and more than any author I can think of, she seems to be hellbent on making sure we all know what that is. Like, when you get right down to it, it was this tendency that I was making fun of in my original article. And I feel like a lot of you would say, like, it's her book. She has every right to say what she wants. And like, of course she does. But the more I think about it, the more arrogant it feels to me that she wants to. Like, like I don't want to diminish her contributions to the world because obviously she created something great that has brought joy to a lot of people, but by that same token, her books were nothing but millions of dead trees until the rest of us picked them up and started reading them. Rowling obviously has her own very specific view of what this world she created looks like, and that's great. I think that's probably why her books feel so lived in and connect with so many people. But that said, once Rowling released her book out into the world, other people started to form their own perceptions about it too. And the longer I think about it, the weirder it feels to me that she would want to do anything that might get in the way of those perceptions. The whole point of books is that you get to view them through your own lens. We read them and impart our own meaning on them based on our own view of the world. Like, not me specifically, obviously, because books are for nerds, but for people who enjoy reading, I'm told this is a big part of the process. And honestly, if J.K. Rowling had limited this tendency to telling people what wizards use for tampons and dishing about who in Hufflepuff is Muslim, then I don't think I would actually care about it all that much in the grand scheme of things. But the fact that she seems so hellbent on trying to control how people perceive the stuff that she puts out into the world does seem to speak to some of her more sinister impulses that are a lot harder to forgive. When she revealed her questionable beliefs to the world, a lot of people were really surprised by it. But looking back on it, the signs were always there. She's always been a woman who sat on her phone all day saying, this is the way things are because I say so. She, she decided that her headcanon is the only one that matters and did her best to impose it on the rest of us in an effort to control the lore. And unfortunately, she's not the only person doing this. The world is full of a million different JK Rowlings trying to impose their own headcanon onto the rest of us. And we're honestly in such a bad place because of it. I truly think that civilization is what happens when our individual worlds crash into one another. We come together and balance our view of the world with that of the person next to us. And when enough of us do this, we stop being a bunch of individuals standing side by side and start being a society. Sometimes this is really easy. Your worlds collide and you find that you're generally on the same page. You have enough shared perceptions that reconciling your two worlds is no problem at all and you're able to come together and build on those shared perceptions in order to create culture and language and all that other fun crap that's central to our society. Sometimes though, your worlds collide and you find that you don't see eye to eye. Your perceptions of the world are so different that 
Reconciling your differing worldviews proves difficult. When that happens, it can lead to one of a few places, some of which are very good, and some of which, well, not so much. On the good end are the times when colliding worlds result in new perspectives. You listen and learn, and your perception changes enough that your world gets a little bit bigger. And when this happens, it's a genuinely great thing. Like, like this is how progress happens. Our perspectives shift enough that more people's worlds fit comfortably into the world at large, and society grows because of it. This doesn't always happen, unfortunately, because sometimes your world collides with another one and you find that common ground is not an option. And this is where things start to get a little bit more complicated. Although, if we're being honest, it's really not that complicated. Like, as far as I'm concerned, there's a very simple solution to navigating these situations, and you probably already know what it is on some level, provided you're not an asshole. When you find yourself presented with a worldview that is so diametrically opposed to your own that you can't figure out how to balance both, I think the best thing to do is ask one simple question. Is it hurting anyone? Ponder it over, get your answer, and based on that answer, you can take it from there. If the answer is yes, then I say defend yourself. Not that I've ever defended myself because that sounds complicated, but I think in this situation a better adjusted person than me has every right to do just that. Nobody has the right to impede on your worldview for the sake of their own, so sometimes conflict is necessary. If the answer is no though, and more often than not I think that this will be the case, then I say get the fuck over it. <laughs> Let them stay in your world and you stay in yours and so long as nothing flips and nobody starts hurting anyone else then I promise you that things are going to work out just fine. The ability to ignore our differences and live side by side with one another even when we don't necessarily see eye to eye on everything is one of the cornerstones of civilization. Like we literally have a name for it and it's called being civil. Unfortunately, though they are very simple, not everyone is always able to follow Willie's rules for a healthy civilization trademark. The question, is it hurting anyone, gets so twisted by the lore of our world that it becomes genuinely difficult for a lot of people to answer it clearly, and this leads to some genuinely bad shit. Like, I genuinely do believe that on some level, Rowling does think that she's being civil, and while I don't necessarily agree, I can see why she might think that. After all, I don't get the sense that she wants to hurt trans people based on her comments. I would be shocked if she condoned violence against trans people, and in her statement, she even says that she knows and loves trans people. Not entirely sure that I believe that last part, but at the very least she cared enough to lie about it, which shows that she's on some level trying to find common ground. I think if I were to sit down and talk to Rowling about it, she'd say she was just stating her belief. She meant no harm by it, and if I were to try and force her to change her views on gender, I'd be doing the thing I accused her of doing this whole video and imposing my perception of the world onto her. And you know what? She'd be absolutely right about that. Like, I truly don't think she should be forced to change the way she perceives gender. D don't get me wrong, I think she should change it, but I don't think that she should be forced to. And I'll be honest, I do think there's a chance she meant no harm by the things that she said. But that said, just because she meant no harm doesn't mean she didn't do any. J.K. Rowling is a powerful woman with loads of influence, and the moment she used that influence to contact millions of people and speak out against an entire group of other people who are not harming anyone, the damage was done whether she meant it or not, because despite what she seems to believe, you can't really control how people perceive the things you put out into the world. I can tell you from personal experience that things get distorted and built upon and change and evolve based on how other people perceive them, and they end up taking on new lives that you never could have predicted in a million years. I personally don't believe trans women are women will inevitably morph into fuck trans people down the line, and fuck trans people will morph into way worse stuff that I won't mention here because it is still meant to be a comedy video. And if those bad things happen, is J.K. Rowling personally responsible for them? No, I don't think that she is, but that doesn't mean that people weren't harmed because of the things that she said. 
I go back to that question, is this hurting anyone? And the answer is absolutely yes. And because of that, I think that the people it hurts have every right to stand up and defend themselves. So they do. They speak up and say, hi, actually, this woman is using her tremendous influence to say things with the potential to cause me genuine harm. So I think we should do what we can to counteract the things she says so that maybe we can limit the harm she causes. And then the internet does its thing and let's limit the harm she causes becomes fuck JK Rowling, which becomes let's dox her family, which like, seriously, guys, not cool. That said, though I don't condone shit like that, I do think that it can get extremely frustrating because after the internet riles everyone up, all the people who were just trying to defend themselves get conflated with the ones doing the doxing and then a lot of people start to view them as the aggressors in a way that genuinely makes you want to tear your hair out sometimes. Like, it's kind of like a much larger scale version of that thing that would happen a lot in middle school where some kid would keep picking on you until you eventually snap and decide to fight back against them, but then it turns out that they're actually a huge wimp and they start to cry, so then you're the one who gets in trouble. Talking to you. Billy Jones. And honestly, this is what happens when you go long enough without ever having to question your lore. It becomes so central to your world that when someone comes around with a perspective that might cause it to change, it can feel like you're being attacked. I think about that story I pulled out of my butt earlier about how gender was formed, and I can't help but feel like a lot of people were left out of it. Like, when Ook and the gang decided that women were going to stay back while the men hunted, there had to be at least one person out in the field thinking, I really feel like I should be gathering right now, but they just never had a way to add their perspective into the mix. I truly think there have been a lot of people who have just never been allowed to add their perspective of the world to our lore, and so our lore was formed without them in it. And as that lore continued to evolve, it became harder and harder for them to jump in and be like, Actually guys, I'm here too. And that sucks because it means that a lot of people throughout history were forced to live in a world that wasn't theirs in ways that were genuinely harmful to them and are still genuinely harmful to them to this day. And as all that is going down, lots of other people were building their perceptions of the world off of the harmful lore that excluded so many others. And that's where things got really, really messy. When those excluded people finally do get their chance to contribute to the lore of society, most of the time it's done as a defense. They've spent their entire life colliding with worlds that don't even know they exist, and so they do what I think everyone should do and ask that simple question, is it hurting anyone? And the answer is absolutely yes. And so they defend themselves, but unfortunately because they're defending themselves from people who don't even realize they were causing harm, it starts to feel like it's an attack. And now that the people in charge of the lore are aware of the fact that their worlds are colliding, they also ask the question, is it hurting anyone? And as far as they're concerned, the answer is yes. They've built their worldview on that lore, so any attempt to change it feels like an attempt to destroy the world as they know it. And so they defend themselves too. Or at least that's what they think they're doing. I would argue that a defense of a defense is closer to an attack, and whether they realize it or not, what they're actually doing is trying to control the lore. I don't think it's a coincidence that once a lot more people were able to get their perspective heard, a lot of others took up the rallying cry of make America great again, because at its core, what that means is that those people just want to go back to the world that they knew, and honestly, that's what controlling the lore looks like. It's clinging to your view of the world, even if it's to the detriment of others. No matter how many people say, actually, America hasn't always been great for me, they choose to close their ears and go, la 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 la, rather than listen to those people's perceptions of the world and try to change their own. In simply dragging their feet, they're imposing their own personal headcanon onto the rest of the world, and that's a really dangerous thing to do because I feel like a lot of the horrible shit that has been done throughout history has been done by people who have decided that they were the first person in history who has ever figured out all the answers and then did everything that they could to make it so that everyone else saw it the same way that they did. 
Thanks to the advent of the internet, countless people finally have the opportunity to contribute to the lore in ways that people will actually listen to. And because of that, it's basically supercharged all those societal processes I described earlier. We've gone from a small group of cavemen staring at each other's genitals to a gigantic, interconnected network of billions of people from all over the world staring at each other's genitals. And hypothetically, this should be great. In a perfect world, it would mean more people finding shared perceptions to build upon and more people being introduced to people with new perceptions so they can broaden their worldviews and make the world a better place for everyone. But unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. We live in an ass world. So what actually happens is absolute ass. I honestly think things are just moving too fast for a lot of us to even try and keep up with, which like, I get it. I think back to my time at my old website and how quickly things moved there and it's enough to make my head spin. Keeping up with the ways the internet changed things was literally our job description and we still couldn't even do it all that well. So I can only imagine how much harder it must be to try and keep up with that shit when the internet isn't even your main concern. It's just some ancillary character in your life screaming in your ear all the time while you're just trying to focus on the stuff that's right in front of you. Like, I'd be lying if I said that I had no idea what people were talking about when they said that PC culture is out of control. I, I don't ultimately agree with that statement, but I get it. It can be exhausting. I try to keep up with it all. I really do. And I simply can't do it all the time. Like, sometimes I stumble upon arguments online that people are like 12 layers deep into and I never even knew they existed. Like, I'll tweet out a picture of like John C. Riley, and someone will respond to me with like, oh, you still support John C. Riley? You know he's against library cards for rescue dogs, right? And I'll be like, no? Is that, is that a thing I should, I should care about? And then I'll go and bone up on the issue of library cards for rescue dogs, and while I do that, someone else will reply like, Library cards for rescue dogs is ableist. Please educate yourself. And I'll sit there being like, I am trying. What is happening right now? And honestly, when this happens, I feel like the best thing I can do is just bow out. I just let that argument rage and do what I can not to interfere with it in any way because I know that I have nothing to contribute to it that could possibly be worthwhile. But unfortunately, bowing out isn't always as easy as it sounds. We are all so connected now in a way that we've never been before. Our worlds are constantly colliding and we're so pushed together now that separating those worlds can be more complicated than just saying you stay in your corner and I'll stay in mine. Our lives are so intertwined that basic civility sometimes requires more than just ignoring our differences and living side by side with one another. It's asking the question, is this hurting anyone? And being able to recognize that sometimes the answer is going to be yes and that you're the one who's doing the hurting. Though it might be an ass ache, sometimes you need to do more than nothing. Sometimes you need to bite the bullet and accept that you need to allow your world to change. I honestly think that a really good analogy for the way this shit works these days is a virus, you know? Just because you don't actively cough on people doesn't mean you won't spread. If you wanna make sure you don't infect anyone, you have to take certain precautions and remove yourself from situations where you might spread it because otherwise you might end up putting something out into the world that hurts people and in certain situations, it might even mutate into something much worse that causes a lot of harm. And like, that should be a metaphor, but we're literally living through a pandemic that won't go away because so many people out there are unwilling to look inward and recognize that their decision to do nothing has the potential to cause serious damage to the rest of the world. Like, like I honestly feel like the earth jumped the shark somewhere around 2003 and God's writing has gotten very heavy handed in the final season. And like, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there's an easy fix here. Well, there is to the virus thing. Everyone, please go get vaccinated if you can. But allowing the world to change, that's really hard. Nobody wants to watch the world they know get taken away from them. So the instinct to fight and try to keep it makes a lot of sense. But unfortunately, not only can the instinct be dangerous, but it's also pointless too, because I have bad news for you. The world you know is going to change no matter what you do.
The first thing I did to make this video was to make a list of things that are popular today. And staring at that startlingly short list was a harsh reminder that this world moves further and further away from being the world that I know with each passing day. I don't know what's popular anymore. I don't know where things are headed. And more than anything, I can't do shit to change that. As much as I would like to snap my fingers and make it 2010 again when things kinda made sense, it's never gonna happen. So as far as I'm concerned, it's better to figure out how to go with the flow than to drown trying to swim against the current. And I feel like right now a lot of you are listening to what I'm saying and hearing you should listen to everything every dude with a hacky sack tells you to do without questioning it. But that's not what I'm saying at all. I don't think listening always means changing, it just means being open to change. Like if you've made it this far in the video and you're not someone who necessarily agrees with what I'm saying, then it sounds like you're someone who's able to listen and that's literally all I'm asking any of us to do. Hear what people around you are saying and look inward to try and change what you can. And if you do that and you still say, no, I don't wanna change, then ask yourself why. Do your best to strip away all those layers of lore and get to the core of what your argument is. Because I think a lot of the time you'll find that what you're saying is that's just the way it is. And unfortunately, that's not good enough. The way it is has never been the way it is. And like, again, that's not to say that this stuff is easy, it's not. In fact, I would say that sometimes it's downright terrifying figuring out how to navigate it, and even the best of us can screw it up sometimes. I said fuck JK Rowling a lot in this video, and I meant it, but by the same token, I can't shake the feeling that she was probably just like me once, just someone trying her best to keep up with all the change, and somewhere along the way she just got tired and lost in her own ideals. like. I don't think that's an excuse for her behavior, but I also don't want to sit here and be like, I'm 100% above that either. The longer I think about the reality that people can see the things I put out and interact with them and disagree with them and form opinions about them and around them, the more daunting it all becomes. The more people I manage to trick into watching this dreck, the more potential it has to make whatever weird mark it's going to on everyone else's world and who the hell knows what that's going to be. I think about the one in a million chance that my videos become popular and I can't help but think of a world where I become like JK Rowling. I think about the idea that the things I put out will get to a point that they begin to affect the world in ways that I don't want. Or I think about the possibility that my videos reach a large enough number of people that reconciling my own worldview with everyone else's gets harder and harder and I start forming my own shitty opinions. I, I think about the idea that I reach a point where I say something that makes me an asshole. Or I just reach the point where enough people discover enough about me to realize that I'm full of shit and not the person that they wanted me to be, which like, yeah, I am a neurotic mess. So even my daydreams about becoming popular can't just be nice. And honestly, everything I'm saying is exceedingly possible. So if in a few years I turn out to be whatever the 2027 version of a turf is, then I would like to apologize on behalf of future Willie. But for as much as this makes me want to curl up into a ball and hide from the rest of the world, I don't think that's the lesson here. Because, yeah, having worlds collide might lead to a lot of bad shit, but it can also lead to progress. And we don't want to miss out on that just because we were scared that things might get a little messy. I think that all we can do is go in knowing that things are going to change and they're not always going to change in the ways that you expect. That said, while you can't always keep the world you know from getting different, you can do your best to make it so that things change in a way that works out better for everyone. For better or worse, we all have the potential to change the lore of our world in ways that are impossible to predict. So at the end of the day, I think that all we can do is put our best foot forward and hope for the best. But basically, just don't be an asshole. I feel like I probably could have saved myself a lot of time and just said that. In any case, if you want to help make me popular, please like and subscribe. And I know a lot of people are going to comment, so just don't be too mean to me because I will read them. Uh, yeah. 
See you soon. Hopefully. Bye. Hey, sorry, this is just for me, but I do want to make sure that I have a good thumbnail again. So uh, you can ignore this part, but I'm going to pose uh, since I think it's about the book. I'm going to pose with the book and I'll be like reading it. And I'll be like. Again, that was just for me. Hopefully I got a good thumbnail just now. Bye, everybody.